All right, uh, hi everybody. Um, this is recorded, uh, pretty much our only uh, recorded segment that John and I are involved in. We get a little break for 30 minutes. Hopefully, uh, hopefully this goes well. Um, please uh, put any comments you want to put in the chat um, or email uh, question at uh, Dine and Cinema Summit, uh, just like the other sessions, and we will follow up as best we can uh, later to get your questions answered if anything comes up during the session. Uh, hope everything's uh, going well so far today. We spent a good amount of time um, previously today and still coming up um, talking about alternative content for cinema and um, expanding essentially to provide other kinds of entertainment um, and uh, destinations for uh, the typical cinema customer to come and visit your, your building, whether it's adding bowling or laser tag or a sports bar. Um, over the last two summits, we kind of touched on this concept of, of expanding your business to be more than just showing Hollywood films. Um, and there was some appetite for it the last two years. Um, obviously, from the position that everybody in this market's in right now, and, uh, and the outlook in terms of Hollywood uh, film releases, um, it's more relevant now than ever for anybody in the cinema industry to be expanding. Um, they're, they're offering to their, their customers. Um, and one option I personally started digging into uh, as we were putting this summit together over the last couple months was uh, live entertainment. Um, so using your, your cinema square footage, um, even auditorium square footage to host live entertainment, in addition to showing film uh, from Hollywood. Um, in my and we live in Austin, as most of you know, uh, the live entertainment capital of the world. Live music, music, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, live music. live music. You can see you can see how dialed I am into the live music scene here in Austin. <laughs> um, and so I, I, you know, jumped on the internet and uh, and looked for some local companies uh, and stumbled across uh, TSC Entertainment um, that has some representation here in Austin and, and around Texas, and so. I have Glenda and Bob here with me from TSC Entertainment. I'll let them introduce themselves in a second. Um, but I had some really interesting conversations with them, and we're here today to try to understand a little bit about the landscape of this industry, the, the live entertainment industry, um, including some of the, the things you might never, never even consider about or consider would be out there that you'd have to solve to have a live music um, act or a live comedian. Um, at your building. Um, we're not here to, to, to tell anybody how to do it. We're just here to talk about those things that need to be considered, mostly from a general perspective, but also know that um, every market uh, around the country potentially is a little di could be a little different. Um, and so uh, our plan down the road is to dig into this even more, but I wanted to take you know 30 minutes today um, to expose this opportunity um, in, in hopefully a creative way that gets everybody thinking about um, uh, whether or not it's a good fit for their business. Uh, the intent here obviously is not for us to try to, or this opportunity to make your business more challenging um, operationally. We all know that you guys are very good at running a very complex uh, dining and cinema already. Um, and we're not at all implying that um, every one of these aspects is that there, that there is a solution for your business to solve it and bring in the live entertainment. Again, we'll follow up more on that later. Correct from TSC Entertainment. Um, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about um, you guys personally, what your role is at TSC Entertainment, um, and then what TSC Entertainment does um, as a company in this space so that it kind of puts a little um, landscape around why I'm talking to you versus talking to somebody else. Sure, uh, I'll start. Uh, I'm one of, we're both managing partners of TSE Entertainment, which is a national entertainment production company. When I say production company, what we do is whatever's needed to produce a live event, whether it's booking the artists all the way through uh, the 
managing the performance and out the door. My role is, is strategic. I'm uh, responsible for marketing and promotion as well as operations and strategic alliances uh, and development of new services. And so I work with uh, also uh, our growth uh, and uh, anything new that we haven't done before that we want to develop, uh, I do the, the legwork on it and see if it's uh, worth doing. And uh, I, I'll say this, I'll let Glenda talk, but we are, we've grown from a Southwest United States company into a national and we're in the process of expanding into Latin America as well. Glenda? So, uh, again, my name is Glenda Black and I am over the booking part of the company. Um, I run a team of agents all across the country and um, we help our clients book both music and non-music entertainment, whether it's for their fair festival, their theater, um, we work with a lot of cities, um, uh, private events, corporate events, you name it. And so our job is to get the artists that uh, our clients are interested in, um, vet those artists, get pricing and availabilities, um, all the way to up to the show and make sure you know the show runs well. Okay, so uh, to try to break this down, uh, maybe even simpler, if I um, if I have a, a venue, whatever it is, uh, and I want to host a live music event, and I have now I don't have any specific requirements. Perhaps uh, maybe I'll have a, what I have is my, a budget, perhaps, mm -hmm. right? I can call you guys and say I got a hundred grand. Who can I book on this day, uh, and what do I need to to what do I have to have at my venue? For that event to be pulled off, is that is that is that a call you guys take? Is that, that, is, is that generic? As a matter of fact, I got one this morning. Okay, so, uh, but uh, but it's also the case that I say, here's what I have. I'm putting on a music festival, and we have the, a primetime act, the last slot in the music festival, the closing act, and we have a budget. We don't need lights. We don't need any of that stuff. All we need is we need the the best act we can get for half a million dollars, and all you do is go secure that act. And so what we do is we um, come back with the list of acts that okay. they would be interested in and we whittle it down from there. Gotcha. The, the, the point is we work with our clients on, we, we try to fit ourselves into their team. So whatever resources they have, we don't try to duplicate it. Right. We try to supplement their team and provide whatever resources are needed well, to make that event. Whether gaps need to be filled, yeah. they can't do it, you guys can fill. You, you come up with a way to help fill the gap. How many companies are like yours in the country? You don't tell me who they are, but how many? How many, if you say, I got, are there, are there 10? Are there hundreds of companies that do what you do at some scale across the country? Maybe in niche markets or niche, they have only certain kind of acts that they book, but how, how how widespread, because these, these people that are listening, they're all over the country. I know you said you're all over the country too, right? Mm -hmm. but, but you're not the only company in the country that does this. Do you want me to? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there, there are major companies that do this. The Live Nations of the world, sure. the C3s yeah. that, that do this for uh, arenas and things around the country. Uh, then there are many, many, what I'll call booking companies who you call, you have a wedding, I need a, right, I need right. a cover band for my wedding, and many of them who do those kinds of things. Uh, fewer who do the soup to nuts thing in okay. terms of handling all aspects of, of your event. Most, most are booking companies and they... They, they have the relationships with the artists. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily have all the different, the, the capability or even the interest in helping the venue pull off the event at the level that someone like you guys has. Right, there's fewer. Fewer of those, gotcha, okay. All right, so based on your knowledge of the industry, um, both you know current and the past year, along with where you think the live entertainment industry was headed before March um, of this past year, how would you summarize the appetite on the artist side, on the, on the artist and the act side, uh, 
for considering doing a live show at a luxury dine-in cinema um, with maximum CD capacity in one room of somewhere between you know 150 and, and 300 um, where the audience is going to be you know seated not a mosh pit in the front of the room seated drinking cocktails getting waited on more like a you know more like a dinner club almost right um, but with a great environment for that audience for that type of person that's going to sit in that chair they they, they love it right um, are the artist interest is there an appetite on the artist side for that kind of environment knowing that it's going to be in my opinion very unique from what they currently get now the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, everybody in this industry is learning new ways to work together um, to benefit one another and where you know some doors have closed or changed there's been these new opportunities and everybody is willing to work together um, and there is an appetite. Um, each you know level of artist may be different if you wanted to start with a lower level, um, more regional act versus a huge national act, mm -hmm. um, I would say every artist is is hungry uh, to get back out there and um, to interact with their, their audience, their fans. The, the pandemic had changed uh, our industry just like it has the, the movie industry. We were shut down too, you know, right. and the, uh, in fact this SBA had just announced uh, uh, this, the venue uh, grant program for, for uh, live entertainment venues because they've all been impacted. Sure. But one of the things that's occurred as a result of, of that is a streaming, uh, just like the movie industry, a lot of uh, entertainment has been streamed and they found ways to monetize that, but also the size of the events, socially distanced events has become smaller. Mm -hmm. So the entertainers have become used to smaller events. Uh, you know, before the pandemic, they might not have considered a 250 uh, right. thing, but now, you know, why, why, so why? Why would they have considered before, like, this is a waste of my time, I don't like playing in front of small crowds, maybe I don't like playing in front of small crowds anymore because I'm a big act. Why do you think they didn't look at it before? Is it because it wasn't presented or because it was presented but they were like, eh, why should I do that when I can go play in front of 20,000 people over here? Why, why do you think they, it wasn't as popular before? I just don't think it, it was, everything was business as usual, you know? You didn't have to think. The um, okay. No. The opportunity might not have been as, as, Pop, maybe it's it just wasn't as presented yeah. as often, right. and yeah, it wasn't. So the pa the package deals that would come to these artists didn't maybe just didn't include that many venues that were of that type. I mean, Austin, right. we have all sorts of venues here, right? Right. So people, there's artists walk into you know small clubs all the time and just take the stage, right? Willie Nelson's famous for doing that at Broken Spoke or whatever, right? Yeah. Like he just walks in on one night a month and they barely even know he's coming. Right? Right, right, and if you're there, it's awesome, right? And Willie doesn't get paid for that, right? right. He knows he likes doing that, uh -huh. right? If he didn't, if he never did it, he wouldn't know how much fun it was, right? right? Well, so yeah. this opportunity, maybe I, I look at it as that same thing. The artists now uh, have been forced into do, looking at these opportunities because that's yes. all there is: socially distanced, small, less than 100 people. But we're talking about this not because of the pandemic. I don't want. That's not what we're talking about. I'm looking at it after the pandemic when you can pack 300 people into a movie theater that's got 300 seats in it, sell every seat. The artist knows I I really like this, mm -hmm. right? So we're being forced into considering it for obvious reasons. But you think the the artists have an appetite because of that? They're going to have an appetite for something like what we're talking about here coming out of the pandemic. Yeah, they yes. they've discovered that they that they like the intimacy uh, of smaller events, right. uh, whether because of social distancing. Let me be clear that they've done they continually have done small events. In fact, Glenda booked a, a wedding, three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar thing for a, for a relatively small wedding in Nantucket. You know. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the artists uh, perform at these small events, but they've typically in the here to for been private events. 
weddings or corporate, or, stuff corporate or, right. or, or whatever. So the, they they will do that as long as <laughs> as long as the money's yeah. there. Sure, they're there. You sure. Know? So something you said a minute ago made me remember. So I watched a event on TV, a streaming thing or a streaming event last week or the week before. Lyle Lovett. If you saw that, Lyle Lovett talked about in his interview. Um, talked about his desire to help clubs open, reopen, be successful. He, like some of these are, and you've heard some of these artists come out and say, uh, we want to go back and we want to play small clubs. We want to play at the, the small, the, the old historic clubs that are around the country that were famous for making them famous, mm -hmm. right? They hadn't played them in years, but they want to go back and play those clubs again because it's like everybody's kind of starting over, right? To give what, back. Right, yeah, to give back, right? This is new. What we're talking about here is is new. It'd almost be like one of the movie studios saying, we're going to roll out a new film just to give back so that the theaters could get open again, right? That's the equivalent, right? So now, what, what do you think, what's your opinion of like, uh, a, a, a while I love it, looking at an opportunity like this and going, man, as much as I want to support the live music industry, I, I don't know that I want to support it in cinema, in that venue, right? Versus going and playing a circuit of small clubs that help him be successful. Or are we creating, would this opportunity be creating too many venues in too many parts of the country that artists maybe aren't, wouldn't be in favor of? There are plenty of artists to fill the market um, that okay. I, I think they would consider. So certain artists might look at it the way that maybe Lyle Lovett would look at it, right? Right. But other artists need all sorts of venues to play in. But yes, it's like, absolutely. Meaning there's not a shortage, there's never really been a shortage of artists. That are short, it's a shortage of opportunity to go play their, do their art. Right. Got it. All right. All right, so it seems like um, there are a few major aspects that, that uh, any venue, not the theater necessarily or cinema, that uh, they need to consider when they're looking at doing live entertainment. Um, whether it's a comedian or a band or a magician or whatever, um, what are the, I guess, so we can kind of dive into some of them a little bit, what are the major categories of, uh, how, or how would you break it down um, for someone to understand what are the major aspects you have to consider? So the three major aspects are physical, and then operational, and then strategic. Okay. All right. It sounds might sound uh, obvious what those are, but uh, what's, let's. And I know we're we're not gonna we don't have time, and I don't want to use this time to dive down into the specifics about each of those things. But let let's let's find a way to to graze them all. Um, so let's first talk about the physical part, where you're hosting an event at your venue live music, comedian, what have you. Um, and you know that most of the luxury dining cinemas in the United States um, are, are fairly new. Um, some are, you know, there's some have been around for 10 years or more, but most of them, most of our customers, many valet's customers are less than seven years old. Um, they have great uh, laser projection, really good cinema sound, great places to sit, most luxury, most of them are luxury recliners, um, great food and beverage service throughout the movie, um, among other things. Uh, so what, uh, on top, how can, can you help us understand the physical requirements um, or issues or things that need to be considered um, within that landscape? That, and I'll comment as you go and try to map it into what I know is to be an auditorium that a, one of our customers, a dining theater, we typically have. Yeah, what, you know, dining theaters already have many of the physical uh, facilities that are needed for that. We're used to a, a blank pallet going into a field or a parking lot and, and creating... Or a ballroom or something. Or yeah. a ballroom in a hotel and creating everything that's needed uh, for a live entertainment event. Uh, the four things that we typically are going to worry about are staging, sound, lights, and a, and a place, what is typically referred to as a green room, is a place for the entertainers to change or rest between shows and, and have snacks and, 
and, and rest. So those are, those are the four things. The most important thing is the stage, having a, a, the area for a stage. So let's talk about that specifically just for a second, right? So um, our, we've been, I've been in, you know, uh, we have a hundred and some theaters across the country, uh, not auditoriums, but physical buildings, right? And I haven't been in all of them, but pr pretty close. Um, and I would say, you know, maybe half of them, um, have what I would consider pretty usable space between the first row and the screen, okay? Um, and when I, but I, I don't know what what usable translates into for a stage. Like, is it like I, I've been into some clubs in Austin where the stage is like like as big as a piece of pizza, right? You know, <laughs> right? It's tiny, but the but the artist jams in there because that's what the that's what the venue is, right? Yeah. And so when I the stage is a great place to start with this conversation because some theaters, I would argue, could could retrofit a stage for very little with very little effort and leave it there, right? Leave it there permanently. And others are going to be like, well, I got to take out the front row seats mm -hmm. to make to make room an adequate stage. So, can you give just a little glimpse of what an adequate stage might yeah, be? Yeah, and and uh, the, the easy answer to that is it depends. Yes. <laughs> on, on what you're going, what's going to take place sure. in, on, in the on that stage and in, in the room itself. Otherwise, you wouldn't put a ten-foot stage into a room that's sixty feet wide. It mm -hmm. would look out of place. Yeah. But when it comes to, uh, a, for instance, a play versus a comedian, very different needs for uh, a stage. Now, when you talk about a, a five-piece band, for instance, uh, five or six-piece, uh, not a chorus, a chorus would be a lot more, you need, you have to understand that the drum, drums themselves take an eight by eight foot area mm -hmm. and that means that the the band is going to be in front of the drums so that you know a very minimum it would be a 12 feet uh, wide stage uh, I'm sorry in depth deep, deep, yeah. mm -hmm. 20 would be uh, 20 16 or 20 would be much better and, and the width can be again 25 30 feet uh, in terms of the width so it's that depth that, yeah, yeah. That, that's the issue in terms of uh, a stage. Okay. Once a stage is in place, the sound, lighting, all that can be rigged from the stage up. So it's, it's primarily the stage uh, that you're talking about. Now okay. when it comes to sound, it's different because you're, you're now mixing all these instruments together, which means you need a mixing panel that where uh, uh, an audio tech is is during before the actual performance they do what is called a sound check so they preset the levels for each uh, each input on the stage but they will adjust them during the show themselves and the other thing it's what's called monitors and that's you see these uh, people with the things in the ears mm -hmm. those are uh, in-ear wireless monitors which means that allows the, the the performer to hear themselves at, at, or their instruments, and that's also adjusted. So there are two kind of mixing boards: one for mixing these monitors in their ears, or there are wedge uh, speakers some people use instead of in the ears, and the other is mixing the sound itself. And and lighting is you just want to make sure that you you know you're not only providing illumination but you're setting the stage and creating right. the effects you want uh, and, uh, and so let me ask you about uh, these general pieces in you know whether it's lighting stage size shape whatever and, and sound stuff when someone says I want to book an act to you to you all I want to book whoever is there like a do they say uh, right away would you come back and say well some of the requirements are the stage has to be 14 feet deep it's got to be can't be ground level the, the artist needs to be elevated at least this much above the ground level what you know mm -hmm. um needs to be this wide needs to be are there does each act have specs or or is it here's my venue and see if you can get this guy this artist to play in it 
like I have my, I'm giving you my specs as my venue dude, and you go find me and go, go get that artist to agree to it. How, what's the, give me a little bit of an insight as to what happens in that dialogue or that conversation. So the art, each artist um, has a, what's called a writer, um, both technical and hospitality writer, and um, they, it's their wish list. And um, in the perfect world, uh, in a perfect venue setting, this is the size of stage they would want. Okay. But when you reach out to them, you know, you say, hey, this is our venue. Um, and they, these artists have played in every kind of right. setting you can imagine. Right. Um, and they're usually willing to work in, with what is, is okay. given. And, and, okay. and you, you mentioned, like, the soundboard and all that equipment. Totally get it. But, again, that's going to be different if you're a, if a single acoustic act versus a comedian versus a 7P, you are almost talking morally about almost worst case, right? Like uh, we got yes. a 7P band that's, coming in uh, and it's complicated, right? That was yeah. almost worst case. At, at, at the simplest, it's a simple PA system with a microphone yeah, and right. a couple of speakers okay. out there, yeah. you know, for a comedian or whatever. Right. Uh, the bigger the art is, the more requirements, both sure. technically and hospitality. I mean, it's not unusual for a big artist to have a 25, 30, 40 page writer that says, I just want green M&Ms in the bowl <laughs> in, in, in the green room. Uh, so, you know, but there are a lot of hungry artists and, and like Glenda said, everything is negotiable. In fact, that's one of the things she spends her time doing is it's negotiating that writer. Okay. It's just not booking them. After you, after you confirmed a booking, then go you go to negotiating that 27 page rider okay. about you know can gotcha. we throw in some purple m ms in there <laughs> okay, you know? right okay got it thank you um, but there are experts that can come in and help evaluate your situation yes. for you and and all those are handled by us otherwise you know uh, we can we can even we can bring in risers for stages and the trusses oh, yeah, for point. lighting and and the and but it's going to cost more as a venue i have to pay more for yes. that as opposed to understanding what a good set of requirements might be and i set up a stage that's going to be good for 75 percent of the artists that mm -hmm. i want to have come mm -hmm. through and i put some sort of lighting on the wall that doesn't show when i'm showing a cinema a movie but it it lights up the stage good enough for that artist to come and play there uh, or 75% of the artists that I might want to come and play there, so I don't have to bring lighting in 75% of the time. Same thing with sound, yeah. right? I can invest mm -hmm. as much as I want to get exactly. my, my setup done to accommodate a good amount of artists. And if an artist says, I need, you know, 27 lights hung from the ceiling, I then have to go, for that one guy, one artist, I have to go get a lighting company to come in and stick more lights up. Well, you know, oh, you guys could do yeah, that. yeah, and okay. we could we could handle that. In fact, if you were going to do this routinely above the stage, because you need to backlight and 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 mm -hmm. fill light, you would use a, a grid, a pipe grid, right, and and put that up there, one that you could you know either attach instruments or lower it down, down and put sure, whatever sure. instruments gotcha. you need for that artist okay. uh, that's needed, and that makes it a lot simpler. Yeah, for that makes good sense. Come in. Okay, so. Um, all right, so now let's move move on to the the operational stuff. Mm -hmm. um, historically, cinemas, uh, they're these dining cinemas, they're they're very complex operationally. It's not, you know, serving popcorn and milk duds at the concession stand, and then people come out and throw their trash away, and someone goes through and cleans up. This, these are huge kitchens. They have a hundred some people working on a Friday night in the building, whether it's in the kitchen doing serving people. You know, whatever, right? They're 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 complex, and they're they're these dining cinemas have become very good at that, right? So there's certain operational aspects that they look at as um, you know pretty easy, right? At this point, one thing that has evolved a lot in the last um, many years is that the the show itself is operationally extremely simple. It's run by a computer. They, the projector fires up, the lights go down all up, you know, there's no nobody up there dimming the lights. In the old days, was, you know, I was never up in a mez in the old days, but I've seen them. 
to where, you know, there's there's projectors where they got reels up there, right? And they have to transfer and the projectionist has to flip the reel to reel at the right time, right? That's more operationally complex, right? Mm -hmm. Now the operationally complex part of a theater from the show perspective is going in before and taking all the orders from the people and then food orders, going to the kitchen and delivering that. That's the operational complexity. The rest of it, there's one guy that, one person that runs the projector system essentially for the entire, maybe the entire company across seven locations, they just program the, the films, right, into that. Right. So they, they've, the, the theaters aren't really accustomed today to saying, to, to having a comp, an operationally complex show, right? Does right. that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about what some of these issues or things to consider operationally are that they would have to, somehow somebody has to, right? Either the mm -hmm. theater staff themselves or they have to, would have to bring somebody in mm -hmm. if they're doing a, a live show to, to handle some of those things. So the first thing would be advancing the show where um, an individual uh, reaches out to the tour manager um, and, uh, you know, you have set up what time they're rolling in, what time load-in is, when they load the equipment in, and that's something you got to think about. How are they going to get their equipment sure. in there? Um, uh, you know, sound check, all of, all of those types of things. But uh, in addition to that is, even before that, is reaching out to their management company um, for marketing materials. And so uh, that piece has to be coordinated because they give you specific um, assets that you use to build your marketing materials, and then they approve it and the plan. And so, okay. um, uh, you know, what do they need security-wise? You know, all of those types of logistics. Or well, you mentioned the green room, mm -hmm. right? That's a physical thing. You gotta have you gotta have a green room. If it's a, if it's a RV in the parking lot, that could be a green room. That's Absolutely. right. But if it's if it's a if it's a, you know, converted manager's office or converted storeroom that is underneath the risers in the in the building in the in a typical theater, there's all sorts of little offices and big offices and things in a the theater where there, there's space that could be had, right? But the physical part is to get that thing, but then someone has to operationally manage that green room situation, right? You, right, you go need, buy the groceries yeah, and go, go in it. Right, go, yeah, exactly, go make... Or use what your own kitchen... Yeah, to right, all right, exactly, mm -hmm. okay. Um, all right, good, any other operational things that are worth throwing out there right now? Because well, the, you know, uh, the last one is, is the um, 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 strategic part. Right, uh, which yeah. selling which tickets, in the marketing. selling tickets yeah. brings in the marketing. You just kind of touched on, right? Um, but I just want to make sure we're not missing any operational things. You know what Linda's talking about there. You know, from from the time you reach out to book, to negotiation, to making the performance happen. Yeah. Prior to the performance, the sound checks, the logistics. Uh, you know, performers can be, you know, a little. I don't know. Well, yeah. what would you call them? But somebody needs yeah, to don't say anything bad. herd them, you know, uh, whether it's like herding cats. Yeah, herding cats. Somebody needs to be there okay. and, so, and so see if they're A lot of these needs. theaters that are watching, right, um, they've become really good at, at doing private events, right? Especially in the last 10 months. They've been yeah. able to have private events at these cinemas, at, in their theaters. Um, well, I, I could rent rent out a whole auditorium and bring my whole family and, and maybe some families down. As I'm taking responsibility for taking care of the social distancing part. It's mm -hmm. it's my auditorium, mm -hmm. and they take good care of me. They have usually have like a an event coordinator mm -hmm. that works at these places now there full time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it doesn't sound like to me it doesn't sound like there's anything that that you know there's some differences. There's no doubt, but I think we can move on to the the final piece, the strategic piece, uh, because nothing. To me, nothing strikes as that I need to, we need to dwell on on the, on the operational part. Um, it seems pretty straightforward. Right? Yeah, and okay. you know, to get into this business, you you you've got to understand the market you're targeting to. Uh, it may be your your local market where you're already drawing uh, from the cinema point of view. Yep. The bigger the name, the further you're drawing from. Uh, so I, th yeah. I think you're touching that. You're, that's going to be one thing that's that's quite different in that, you know, cinema films come out and there could be a cinema seven miles away. It's showing the same film, same Disney film, the same Warner Brothers film, right? So your circle, your audience, your your known customer base, 
is either someone that's willing to drive a long way because you have really good food or, or great service uh, because they want to see the cinema, the movie, they can go to their one that's right next door. It might be different than your venue, but they don't have to mm -hmm. go far. This is different. We're talking about sure. you're, you're not going to book act, you know, act A on the same night or even in the same week at two different cinemas right down the street from each other, right? So people, your circle is going to be bigger. And, and I'll, so to start this conversation off or let you, kind of lead you a little, little more, you know, these cinemas are typically haven't had to do a lot of, they, they do social media marketing, they do, you know, certain things, they get all the content from the studio, a lot of that marketing kind of comes from the studios, the movie posters, the trailers, and they put them on their website and they push it on social media and they, they've been building up this clientele over the last several years that are their audience. When I go to the movies, I go to this cinema, right? And they're proud of that. They, their, their loyalty programs are, are doing, you know, have done really well the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty easy to market to that loyal base with the emails or social social media to reach out past that because if I'm an if I'm a fan of an artist, I might drive a hundred miles to go see that artist at that I've done it before. I've gone to Houston for X. I've right. gone to San Antonio for X that's right. because that's the closest they are. So now you have an opportunity to expand your market, which helps you raise your ticket price essentially to create the supply and demand to where you know we're not you wouldn't drive to San Antonio to see a twelve dollar film or a twelve dollar movie, but I would drive to San Antonio to see a certain artist. And because I'm doing that, I got to know I'm going to pay more, right? So that's, yeah. to me, that's a big part of this, the strategic part that is going to be new to this industry, I, I think, or it's going to be different. Yeah, I want to touch on something you just said um, before Bob goes back to the strategic part is um, there's something in a, in a contract called a radius clause saying, you know, like average, you can, an artist cannot play within 100 miles in a venue within 100 miles. 60 days before or 30 days ah, after. Interesting. And so it protects that venue from competition. From time frame. Yeah. Yeah, holding that market. So, hmm. and you can set the the mileage and the dates and things like that. Oh, that's okay. That makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah. The uh, so you know, obviously, matching your market to your artist is important. Uh, you can do it either way. If it's a big name artist, uh, they will bring that market to them. If if you're if you're looking for a smaller event mm -hmm. that will you know uh, reach your your local market, uh, you can you can do it that way and find the artist for that market. The uh, the key thing is you know as you alluded to earlier, these are sit down venues where people are eating. So you're so you're going to have to select the acts that play that are appropriate for that kind of market. You're not going to you're not going to uh, book an act that will have people standing on the seats and jumping up and down on your on your uh, very expensive seats with all those sensors in them and such. Uh, so, uh, so so you need to be particular about that. There are things you can do to uh, make the economy of scale better. Uh, in in a in a theater to get people who are used to who typically would play in a larger venue, you can do multiple uh, multiple shows a, a seven o'clock an early show and a late show. Uh, you can do tours. Well, if if we call them routing tours, if I if I'm a, a, a cinema chain, I not I own I book this artist not in one place but in all or five of my cinemas and I can create a package deal uh, for that. Artists also use what are called back-end deals uh, and, and it gets back to ticketing and, and, and uh, the food sales, food and beverage sales. Uh, a back-end deal is where I play your, your venue and I ask for a guarantee of X dollars and I re now if I'm just that if that's the only thing I it might be here but I'll ask for X dollars and I want 30 percent of the door which means 30 percent of the ticketing or 30 percent of the ticketing and the food okay. and beverage sales those are called back-end deals in, in the business okay and so uh, you know where appropriate you might be able to do something like that if you're not sure uh, uh, of how you're going, you're, you're putting more risk in the artist's hands by by with a back end deal that they're gonna that they're gonna fill the place. Okay. But the uh, you know there's uh, uh, the thing about it is 
other than other than the room you can do these from a temporary point of view you can try this out with risers for the stage eight foot risers and bring them in and out and set up a set up an event to try it and and as you know to put your toe in the water so to speak and you know working with a company like ours or, or a similar company you can will provide whatever you need and hold your hand through the process. I mean, you know, as I said, sometimes we work from a blank slate. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the events we produced was, was a Parks and Recreation Department that had a big park, literally a big field, mm -hmm. no, no electricity to it, no water to it, and so they want to hold a, a festival there. <laughs> and they've never done anything like that before. So what do we do? We hold their hand, tell them what they need, work with them, become their partner. Hook them up with the right companies to come do we, the power, to do the lights. We, yeah, you know, we put the from, fencing up. To from the latrines to the tents right, to, right, the, right. to the yeah. food vendors. Right. Otherwise, but I think what, that's what typically people think of, of as live music, right? Live music, live events. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, looking at... And, and, you know, I'll be honest with you. There, in the all the a lot of the theaters I've been in, historically the, the older ones that have gone through remodels, you you it's hard to find a power outlet in a movie theater. It is and historic. All the new ones, they all have recliners. Every one of those recliners has a power outlet. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's power everywhere now, right? So yeah. certain things were daunting for this industry or like a park and rec thing to consider, right? But as, as they they invest in this concept. Uh, like the, then they'll start putting power drops in the park so that they know they're gonna have the festival every year. So power has to be brought in. They invest a certain amount of infrastructure exactly. so that it gets easier. And, and you're right. I think I, it makes sense to me that there's a path to where a theater could start, the cinema could start small and build on it. Um, and then the next part of the conversation that I don't want to get into today is 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 kind of the economics and the risk, right? How do you do that without taking a huge risk? Um, but, you know, I guess everybody in this industry right now is having to make that decision regardless of what the content is, right? Someone, you might have to take a risk or take a chance. Um, uh, but it, the nice part is I think what we learned today um, from this conversation um, was that there's lots of things to consider. Um, I'm sure we didn't touch on some of them, but I feel like this was, this was exactly what I wanted to accomplish by bringing you here to talk to us uh, because I think that there's, it's a viable opportunity um, for Very everybody exciting. that's yeah, it's for everybody that's listening. I, I hope that you learn something, and I hope that um, this leads to uh, some good questions from on your side that we can follow up with with these folks on. Um, and I I promise to do that um, uh, over the next uh, couple weeks um, after the summit's over. Uh, thank you for being a part of this uh, thank conversation. You. Thank you. Thank you very it's much. It's all our pleasure. We we would. Really enjoy uh, helping this concept grow in, in the in the theaters. I think it's a good one. Cool. Yes.